My name is Margarita Flores, and I'm an agent of change. I should start by telling you that when I first got the email to invite me to come speak, I opened it, read about four sentences, and then closed it. <laughs> I thought, well, if I didn't read it all the way, I never got the email, right? <laughs> no one will know. Um, I got the second email, and I decided to tell a friend. Uh, and I said, you know, they invited me to speak at, at a TEDx conference in Slovakia, in Bratislava, and I'm not going to do it because I don't have anything important to say. Nothing that I say matters, right? And she said to me, Margarita, what are you afraid of? You can do this. And that's why I'm here. Because I had to remember that I can and I will. <laughs> and so as I... <laughs> And so as I talk today, if I falter, because I will, um, or pause a little bit, um, either one, I'm trying to remember my train of thought, or two, I'm telling myself, you can do this. One of my mother's greatest goals was that I grew up with a strong self-concept. She would often speak to me about what it meant to be Latina. She would say, as she drove or as she cooked, to be Latina is to do what is just, what is right, and what is good. It also means to have courage, to never give up, and to be guided by love. And she never did let me give up on anything, even karate. And her, tu puedes, you can, and her, tu debes, you should, have gone from being the motivating voice that I hear to the motivating voice that I share with others. In 1998, I became a student at UC Berkeley. And my sophomore year, I took a class called Current, Isu Current Issues in Urban Education. And as I went to class week after week and learned about the inequities that students of color were facing in California schools, I began to get angry. You know, that kind of anger that sits in your stomach, the kind of anger that gives you unrest, and it makes you want to rise up. I kept asking, how is this happening? You see, I had wanted to be a lawyer. And by that, what I mean is that my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it was the expected path in my family. Um, so I invited him to come to class with me. I needed him to come and to connect with how I was feeling. I needed him to understand why I can no longer go on observing in a seat what I believe is the greatest injustice of our time. Our public schools in the United States are failing our kids. The system is broken. And so my dad came with me, he sat next to me, he watched me take notes, ask questions, and struggle to understand why a broken system wasn't being fixed. And I still remember it clearly. It was very serendipitous. We sat in the lower right section of class, and two graduate students came in that day. They were there in an effort to recruit students to become teachers after graduation. They showed a clip of a recently released documentary called The First Year which followed four teachers in their first year of teaching. When the clip ended, I looked at my dad, who was sitting to the right of me, my eyes wide, finally a sense of clarity. I knew I needed to teach. My dad grabbed my hand with a quiet smile. He knew I had found a new path, and law school would become a distant memory. <laughs> Very distant. <laughs> So I wasn't going to continue just watching from the sidelines anymore. I was committed to pick up the hammer and the nails and actually work to fix the system. I also knew that I wanted to work the system. I was going to teach. I wasn't just going to learn about education, but I was going to actually get on the front lines and see why this broken system wasn't really being fixed. My mother's tu debes and Tú puedes and tú debes would become I can and I will. I knew nothing about teaching on my first day. And what I had with me, though, was a whole lot of love, a whole lot of courage. I was gritty, I was hungry to learn, and I knew that I was going to stop at nothing short than being the teacher that my kids needed me to be. 
Two years later, I met my first group of students. They were in first grade and six weeks into their first grade year. I became their sixth teacher. Just so we're clear, that's one new teacher a week, a problem that has become all too common in our public schools. But my students were eager to learn, and I, on that first day, couldn't wait to see everything they knew. They had already been in school for six weeks. So I gave them an assessment. I sat with each one of them to see what they already knew. At the end of the day, I sat there, feeling a bit defeated. You see, only five of my 22 students knew all the letters of the alphabet. My students had already been in school for two years, and only five of them knew all the letters of the alphabet. The inequities I had learned about two years prior were now slapping me in the face. That hammer and those nails—it was time to pull them out. That year, I worked very, very hard with a no excuses attitude to increase their student achievement. But what I kept coming back to was the idea that my students needed more than just one teacher or two that were going to have the love and the courage to react to inequities. That were going to have the love and the courage. To do what others think impossible. In 2010, I did what I thought was impossible and founded a school. I founded an elementary school in Southeast Los Angeles, which would quickly become the third highest performing school in Los Angeles and the highest performing school serving mostly students who are learning English in the state of California. Margaret Mead reminds me to never doubt. That a small group of committed, thoughtful citizens can change the world. I believe Kip is that small group. Kip is a network of charter schools working to change public education in low-income communities. Charter schools are publicly funded, independently operated schools. Yes, we do have more autonomy, but it comes with increased accountability. Now, you might ask, why does the U.S. need? Charter schools. Why does the U.S. need KIPP? Well, across the U.S., 80% of high-income, 80% of students in high-income communities graduate college. That's good, right? That that should be celebrated. 80% of our students are graduating college. Yet, in low-income communities, the percentage is 10. Now, if I take you to South and East Los Angeles, where I've worked for eight years, and where poverty hits the highest levels in the city of Los Angeles, the percentage is four: eighty, ten, four. Our students deserve more. A zip code should not define what a child is meant to be or meant to do. Now I want to be clear that while college is definitely the focus, it is not the end goal. We believe that college is what's going to give our students access to choice and opportunity in order for them to build their better tomorrow. Kip LA Schools currently, currently operates 11 schools in South and East Los Angeles, and 76% of our students and alumni are persisting through college. Our students are showing that they can and will learn. Our teachers and principals are showing that the system can and will be fixed. And our first class of students are going to be college seniors this fall, and they are going to show the city of Los Angeles that students from South and East Los Angeles can and will graduate at a far higher percentage than four. You see, the love that we have for this work moves beyond our students to their families, their communities, and our city. When we provide a quality education to our students, we raise the quality of life for them and their families. And when we do that, the entire city of Los Angeles's quality of life raises. When our students benefit, Los Angeles benefits. When our students thrive, Los Angeles will thrive. Kip LA is in an aggressive growth plan. We're determined to get to 20 schools 
by 2020. When we get to 20 schools, we will double the college graduation rate in the entire areas of South and East Los Angeles. That is our tipping point. That is how we intend to change the face of public education in Los Angeles. When we get to 20 schools, other public schools basically have no excuse. So on August 9th, on August 9th 2010, I opened the gate to a line of families waiting to come into their first day of school at Kip Gomanza Community Prep. I was the principal. And I greeted everyone, I'm, I'm looking down at Mercedes, who's, who you see, uh, with a warm handshake and a hello. Now, it wasn't always easy. And many days, both before we got to that day and after, I would hear in my mind, I can't do this. What if I fail? I'm not enough. And I had to keep coming back to the I can and I will. And beyond just the voice that my mother had, I had now made promises to kids and to families. I had to deliver on those. I had to make sure that my students were achieving at the highest levels and that they were going to be happy, that they were going to be joyful, and that they were going to love coming to school and doing the right thing. At Comienza, we believe that academics are 49% and character is 51%. We think that academics are what's going to get our kids to college, but it's going to be the character that gets them all the way through. It's going to be the character that makes them res resilient and gets them to and through college. And the foundation of our character development are through four values. Courage, ganas, honor, and reflection. Courage is the ability to name and overcome challenges. Our kids say, I can take risks. Ganas is a desire to approach challenges with grit and zest. They never give up. Honor is the love and respect for themselves and their community. I am because we are. And reflection is the examination of ourself and the world around us. I make good choices. Recently, there was a study conducted at Comienza to identify our core strengths. And what a parent said was that the school has taken out the I can't from my child's vocabulary and instead replaced it with, if I try hard enough, I can succeed. We can't do this alone. We need our families. And so every summer, our staff goes to every home to recommit to the promise that we're making. We sit down, we learn about them again, and we recommit to follow through on the promises. We set expectations, and we determine how we're going to work together. We also develop them through workshops, monthly workshops, and give them the tools and resources that they're going to be able to make decisions all the way through for their child until they graduate from college. And we are a blended model. So what that means is that we use technology and small group rotations to teach our students. We want to make sure that all of our students learn at their level. And so the way we did that is that we, we actually built out the day into blocks of time so that our students, who were in classrooms of 30, 30 kids, could get small group instruction. And so our students always experience literacy and math in small groups of six to eight kids. What teachers are expected to do is to collect data in those small groups, both in informal ways and formal ways. And every week, they meet on Mondays to analyze the data from the week before to make flexible groupings. They change the groups every week to make sure that students are in the right group at their level to learn new content. And so a typical day, a student comes in, and after morning meeting, they go into small group reading instruction. In math, the same thing happens. And when students are in front of their teacher, there's one group in front of their teacher, there's another group doing technology on a program that is spiraling through content and giving them supplemental instruction, and another group is working to apply those skills that they've learned with their teacher at their own level. 
All of our students have their own individual book boxes, again, at their level to make sure that they're able to apply the skills that they're learning in reading comprehension to books that are right for them. They're researching, getting ready for class, and they love it. They look happy. Small groups allows for meaningful relationships. From a student perspective, they feel safe in a small group. They're able to take more risks, and they ask for help. And from a teacher's perspective, they're getting really important information to make sure that they're asking the right kind of questions to each child and pushing each child at their right level. This works through teacher investment. Our teachers believe that what they're able to teach in a small group environment is about twice as much as what they would be able to teach in a whole group environment. They also believe that technology is what's going to prepare our kids for jobs that don't even exist today. And so that day, when I was in the lecture hall at UC Berkeley, I had a moment of choice. I could have chosen to believe someone else will do it. The day after I gave the reading assessments to my kids, I could have chosen to believe they're just too far behind. And many days as a principal, I could have chosen to believe I can't do this. My parents and my schooling gave me a really strong sense of self-efficacy. I know how to dial down the lack, in, the lack in fear and dial up the love and courage. And this love that I speak of isn't warm and fuzzy. <laughs> There's vulnerability, discomfort, and real fear. And I've been told that when there is vulnerability, discomfort, and real fear, you should do it. This love that I speak of is inherent in all of us. But what I have found in 14 years of working in education is that we need more leaders to unleash this love. We need leaders to create the environments for teachers to create, innovate, and take risks. We need leaders that are going to continue to develop the self-efficacy of their teachers through learning experiences and relationships that send the message, this is hard work. I'm not going to give up on you, and our students will achieve. You see, I don't actually think it's about money and resources and technology. It's a mindset shift. We have to remember the I can and I will. And so the next five minutes are going to happen, and the next week is going to come and go and you will have moments of choice. Will you choose to dial up the love and courage? Will you listen to the I can't? Or will you choose to believe I can and I will? Thank you.